truly committed. Uh, okay, we want to give you an update on uh, what we know as of today and the recent numbers today. Also, I want to take a moment to go through the uh, overall context of what we're doing. Every day we go through the daily updates, but again, this it's important that people see and understand the overall context of what is going on. What is all this about, what the United States is doing, what they're talking about in Washington, what we're talking about here? Slow the spread of, a vi of the virus to a rate that the healthcare system can manage. Slow the spread of the virus to a rate that the healthcare system can manage. You are not going to stop people from being infected. Uh, there are all sorts of percentages about what percent of the population will be affected. 40%, 50%, 60%. Uh, you will not be able to control that. Nobody thinks you can. But you can make efforts to slow the spread because the real question here is can your health care system manage the influx of patients? That's all this is about. And China, South Korea, Italy, it's the same lesson over and over and over again. You get into trouble when the healthcare system can't manage that rate of intake. So try to slow the spread so it equals your capacity in the healthcare system. What do you do to slow the spread? Test, 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 test. We've made great progress on testing. Uh, the president's agreement to allow New York State to uh, do its own testing is very important. We need more federal assistance in allowing what's called automated testing, which the FDA still controls. Roche is a company that does automated testing. Uh, the president made an, announce an announcement with them, but it can't just be a couple of companies for the United States of America doing automated testing. We need more automated testing. What does that mean, automated testing? Manual, you put the test tube in the machine. Automated, everything is robotics. It goes from 30 tests per day to 1,000 tests per day for a laboratory that can go from manual to automated. So that is a tremendous difference. And we need more help on that. How else do you slow the spread? Density control. This awkward seating arrangement that we have here today reflects two things. Number one, that the LCA doesn't work on Sundays. Number two, spacing out the seating, reduce the density. So reduce the density the best you can. Those are both slow the spread strategies, okay? What does it mean to slow the spread? This is Dr. Fauci, great New Yorker, by the way. Uh, you see everyone in Washington looking at the charts of the curve, the curve. Flatten the curve, flatten the curve. Reduce the rate. So the high point of cases is reduced so it can be managed by the healthcare system. That's what they're talking about. Flatten the curve, flatten the curve. Why do you want to flatten the curve? Because the curve is not a curve. The curve is a wave. And the wave could break on the hospital system. That's what they're talking about when they're talking about the curve. If you have too high a number of people sick at the same time, when they descend on the hospital system, you will overwhelm the hospital system. That's the issue here. It has always been the issue here. Overwhelming the capacity of the hospital system. And uh, that, my friends, is important. You know, we spend, you listen to the cable news all day, well, why didn't we start testing earlier? Why weren't we more prepared? That's all about yesterday, right? 
That's all recriminations, that's blame. We should have done this, we should have done that, we should have done this. Uh, I'm a governor. I am here today. I'm focused on what I need today to prepare for tomorrow. And that's what everybody should be focused on. You want to do a retrospective on who should have done what, when, and who's to blame? Put a pin in, pin in it and do it afterwards. Let's be constructive, which is focusing on today and tomorrow. There's an old military exp expression that management officials use, don't fight the last war. This is not about what happened yesterday. We are looking at a new war that no one has seen before. This is a case of first impression for this nation. We have never fought a virus like this with this potential consequence. So uh, plan forward, plan forward. You see that wave? Try to reduce the size of the wave. Assume you can't reduce the size of the wave. And assume the wave breaks at a higher level than the hospital system can accommodate. I believe that's what's going to happen. So what do you do? New York State hospital capacity, 53,000 beds, 3,000 ICU beds. Is that a lot of beds? Is that little beds? 3,000 ICU beds, presently about 80% occupied, OK? So that means you have several hundred ICU beds available. Why are the ICU beds uh, important? Because the people who come in, vulnerable populations, older people, underlying illnesses, respiratory problems, they need the ICU bed. They need the ventilators. They need the machines that breathe for them. Those are the ventilators. They are in ICU beds. The overwhelming crush is going to be on the ICU beds, not the 53,000 normal hospital beds, because those are basically going to be people recovering from the flu. You can recover from the flu at home. If it's really bad, you go into the uh, hospital. They make sure that you are not dehydrated. But the critical people are the people who had underlying illnesses and need those ICU beds and those ventilators. 3,000 goes very, very quickly on any projection of these numbers. What do we do? Maximize existing hospital beds and hospital capacity. Potentially build more capacity. Again, we're only talking about several weeks here before that wave breaks. Potentially build more on the existing hospitals. Provide more staff. Identify backup staff. That's why we're going to medical facility, medical schools. Uh, retired nurses, retired doctors, develop a reserve staff because healthcare workers will get sick. And when they get sick, they go home. You want to limit the hospitals, limit staff. That's the way you limit the hospitals. Find doctors who are on reserve and purchase the necessary equipment. What makes an ICU bed an ICU bed? Primarily the ventilator. These ventilators are expensive to begin with, and they are scarce. And you can't find available ventilators, no matter how much you're willing to pay right now, because there's literally been a global run on ventilators. And free up beds that are in the hospitals. How do you do that? Uh, two ways. One. We may get to a point where you cancel elective surgery. You can have your hip replaced next month, not now. Uh, or develop a, another facility that you can move people from an existing hospital bed who don't need intensive care into a different facility. 
how can you build more hospital capacity now? That's a great question. It has never been done before. Uh, it takes years to build a hospital. Uh, it takes years to convert an existing facility into a hospital. Uh, it's billions of dollars. It's a workforce uh, in the thousands. But on the theory of try everything, an area that we have to explore is can you build more hospital capacity now? I'll get back to that in a minute. On the reducing density, slow the spread by reduced density. Uh, I've been talking to private businesses all across the state. Uh, I am asking them to aggressively consider work from home strategies. I'm asking them to aggressively consider voluntary closings to help reduce density as a social responsibility, to protect their workforce. Uh, but I want private businesses to aggressively consider work from home and voluntary closings. Uh, depending on what businesses do on a voluntary basis, we could consider mandatory actions later on. We've already taken mandatory actions. No large gatherings over 500, 50% of legal occupancy of a facility. That is a mandatory way to reduce density in the workplace. I'm asking them today to voluntarily consider closings and reductions in workforce. Uh, if need be, we can calibrate up the mandatory requirements that I have already put in, in action. Uh, how do you calibrate it up? Rather than 50% of occupancy, it could be 40% of occupancy or 30% of occupancy, et cetera. I'm not doing that at this point, but I am asking businesses to aggressively consider these measures. Uh, if the private sector does not uh, respond voluntarily, if the spread does not slow, then I would increase the mandatory uh, guidelines. For New York State government, lead by example, lead by example, all non-essential personnel in the state are asked to stay at home from Rockland County South. That's about half the workforce of the state in that area. Uh, why Rockland County South? That is the area of highest density of the number of cases. Remember again, the number of cases varies widely across the state. You're calibrating your actions to the data, to the science. You should be doing different things in New York City than you're doing in a county upstate that only has one or two cases, right? This is a calibration by science to the facts. The New York State court system uh, congregates many people, uh, tens of thousands of people all across the state. I spoke to the chief judge. Uh, I asked her to come up with a plan that keeps the essential services operational, uh, criminal justice services, emergency family services, et cetera, the essential services available, but non-essential services actions that can be postponed to postpone them. Again, reduce the density coming into the court system. I'm asking private businesses to stay home. Uh, reduce the density coming into the court system. Don't jeopardize the criminal justice system. Don't jeopardize safety. Don't jeopardize uh, family integrity. Uh, but if it's non-essential, then postpone it and then come up with a plan that reduces the courts uh, to follow that concern. Uh, the chief judge is a total pro. She is not just a great jurist, she's also a great manager. Uh, she's managed large operations before. Uh, 
Uh, and all of her skill and tenure has been on display here as uh, the chief judge. And uh, she's I ideally suited to do this. I asked her to come up with a plan tomorrow that she will announce on the spe specifics of how she'll implement this. How else do you re reduce density? You come to the issue of schools. She reopened schools, closed schools. A number of schools have closed. We've added Jim Malatris. You all remember Jim Malatris. He used to work here. He then semi-retired, went to academia. He doesn't consider it semi-retirement, but I like to irk him that way. Uh, close the schools. It's not that easy. It's not that simple. Uh, close the schools. For many families, the school is childcare. If the student, if the, you close the schools and the children are home, a large percentage of the workforce may say, I have to stay home and take care of my children. Uh, there are school districts that are in wealthier parts of the state where the family is in a position where one parent stays home or where they can hire a caregiver to stay at home. Uh, but then there's everybody else, right? Uh, I'm from Queen, Queens, New York. I grew up in a very working class neighborhood. There, most families don't have a caregiver at home. If the children stay home, one of the parents have to stay home. If there's only one parent in the house, that parent has to stay home. Yeah, but we have essential workers who need to go to work. Police people, fire officers, healthcare workers, again, because we said this is all about the capacity of the healthcare system. We can't have 1199 healthcare workers uh, not coming to work because they have to stay home. We can't have nurses staying home because they have to stay home and watch their child. Uh, so it sounds simple, it's not simple. You close the school, how do you feed the children? For many children, the breakfast and the lunch are the two main meals they get, and they get that at the school. How do you distribute food to all these children who are now not in school? So those are very real concerns. If you can address those concerns, address the negatives of closing the schools, then yes, close the schools. Why? Because it's totally in line with our density reduction, et cetera. Uh, these concerns can be addressed, and it's up to the locality to come up with a plan to do it. Uh, we're speaking to Nassau, Suffolk, and Westchester. County Executive Laura Curran, County Executive Steve Ballone, Suffolk, uh, County Executive George Latimer uh, in, in uh, Westchester. Uh, they're interested in closing schools. We said closing schools, if you can, uh, you can reduce the negative, child care, et cetera, student meals, then I think it's a good strategy. But we have to address those two negatives. The worst negative, is if we lose essential workers. Police officers say I can't come to work. Firefighters say I can't come to work. Uh, public transportation operators say I can't come to work. Uh, and most dramatic impact, hospital workers. Because remember the hospital workers, there will be hospital workers who get sick. That's going to happen. That will reduce staffing in hospitals. That has to be factored in because you know that's going to happen. So uh, given that, you want to make sure you're not artificially making that problem worse. Uh, Jim Malatris is going to be working with these counties to try to put together these situations uh, that would take care of the, the negative consequences of closing schools, which would then facilitate the closing of schools. Ongoing operations,
just so we sum up, we're doing testing. We've made great progress there. Thank you, Vice President Pence. Thank you, President Trump. We have more to do. Density reduction, which is what we've been talking about. School closures uh, and taking care of the negative consequences that might happen is an ongoing function. Hospital capacity, hospital capacity, hospital capacity. Uh, and tracking of the cases, mapping of the cases, identifying the clusters so we deploy our resources. The numbers today, total tested is up to 5,272. As I've said every day, the more you test, the more positives you will find. New cases, 442. I'm sorry, newly tested 442. This is just testing data. 5,200 tested, 442 tested since last evening. Is that correct? Yeah, so yes. far this morning. So you see how fast, we were only doing 200 tests per day. We now did 442 since last evening at about six o'clock when we did the last briefing. Uh, positive cases, 729. New cases, 69. New York is the state that has the most number of cases. Again, you would have to cor correlate that to how many tests the other states are doing, because the more tests they're doing, the more cases they will find. We've had uh, three deaths. We had an additional death since we spoke last. A uh, 79-year-old woman who had multiple major underlying health issues uh, and had the coronavirus and succumbed to the coronavirus. Current hospitalizations, 137 out of 729. That's 19% of the cases. This number relates back to hospital capacity. 65 patients in ICU already. This is against the number of beds available in ICU units. And you can see how quickly these numbers move. 46 patients intubated. Again, perspective, perspective, because we're fighting the virus, we're fighting fear. The fear is winning, and the fear is disconnected from the facts. Fear is an emotion. Emotion can often be disconnected from facts, and that's what's happening here. But this tracks all the cases that have been, uh, have happened since China, 156,000 cases, 5,000 deaths. You look at the people who have passed away in the state of New York, the three people. Uh, those are people who may very well have passed away from contracting the flu, right? Every year, tens of thousands of people die from the flu. We say they died from the flu, but they very often had, they were battling cancer. They had heart disease. They had emphysema. And then the flu, on top of that underlying condition, uh, was the straw that broke the camel's back. I did an open letter to President Trump today uh, that made three points. It says, we know what is going to happen because we have the data and the projection. Look at China, look at South Korea, look at Italy, and just plot the numbers. You know the curve. You know how effective you are at flattening the curve, and we are now looking at a wave. And we know it is a wave. Do everything you can to reduce the wave. We are. It's still a wave. It is going to be a wave. And it is going to be a wave that at any of these projections will overwhelm the healthcare system. I asked three things. One, on the testing that 
Uh, and I'm grateful that he approved the New York testing capacity. FDA has to get out of the way on the automated testing capacity. Let us approve automated testing companies. It can't be one or two companies are the only companies in the United States doing this. You need hundreds of thousands. Accelerate the testing. Second, the federal government has to provide help and guidance to states on what to do and when to do it. This can't be a national policy of every state does its own thing. You can't have a patchwork quilt of policies. New York State closes stores. Okay, New Jersey doesn't. What did I do? I just sent thousands of vehicles over to New Jersey, flooding New Jersey stores. New Jersey closes stores, and I don't. What did they do? They just sent thousands of New Jersey people to shop in New York and then go back to New Jersey. You cannot do this ad hoc, one state at a time. Make a decision, tell the states, this is the decision, and then let's go. Closing schools. If you think schools have to be closed, well then, help us. Where do we get the child care? Where do we get the meals? Where do we get the money to provide the meals? There are ways to do it. We could just increase what's called the SNAP program, the food assistance program to a family, and say, you know what? Your, your food assistance uh, payment is going to go up 50%. You buy Johnny breakfast and lunch. But uh, we have the federal government that is integrally involved in that. Help us plan and help us coordinate. And don't pit one state against the other inadvertently by having them come up with different policies. That's the second point. The third point is this you're going to need more hospital capacity. You're going to need more facilities. You're going to need ways to free up those 53,000 beds. You're going to need to construct or retrofit physical buildings. Acquire thousands of pieces of equipment like this. The state can't do that. I don't have that workforce. I don't have the resources, but even if I had the resources, I don't have the physical capacity to turn SUNY dorms into hospitals in three weeks. I can't. There's only one workforce that can do that. It's the Army Corps of Engineer, Engineers, and the military assets, that's what they do. They build bridges, they build camps, they have tens of thousands of personnel, trucks, equipment, excavators, logistical managers, purchasing power. Use them to come in right now, identify existing facilities that can be retrofitted, and use them to do it. China built dozens of hospitals in literally like a month. How? The Chinese government came in and said, we're going to do this, we're going to nationalize it. South Korea, the same thing. You can't leave it to the states. I can't do it. I do not have the resources or the capacity. And by the way, I'm an aggressive governor. I push very hard, but there's no way that we could uh, manage this undertaking. The Army Corps of Engineers, I used to be in the federal government, I've worked with them, they're amazing. Their capacity is amazing. And what better time to use those resources than saying, let's get to work, Let's retrofit buildings. Let's purchase the equipment. 
Yet, let's use that massive logistical machine of the military to actually save lives. It makes all the sense in the world. And by the way, we have no option. We have no options. You know what management is? Pick the best option. My expression to my colleagues, what are my options? Well, you have none. There's only one. OK, I pick that option. You have no other option. Otherwise, we will be sitting here nine weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks from today, seeing a healthcare system overrun. We will be saying, we knew this was going to happen. Why didn't we provide more health care facilities? Why didn't we do everything we could to make that a reality? Doing everything you can to make that a reality means bringing in that Army Corps of Engineers and that military expertise. And I hope the President takes me up on it. With that, questions, comments, any points I left out to my colleagues here? One other. Um thing that we're starting tomorrow is the DMV is going to be moving to appointment only so that we keep crowds out of the DMV. You can do that online, or if you don't have access online, you can go to the DMV, make an appointment, and then come back. So, Governor, based on everything you just said, does it make sense to bring the legislature back here this week with their staff, hundreds of people at the Capitol, when you're saying even businesses should possibly close or work from home? Government is an essential operation to manage this situation. To me, that's like saying, in a war, when people might get killed at war, does it make sense to send soldiers? But they have to physically be here this week. I mean, there's other things you could do. Close the Capitol for a couple of weeks. Karen, this is now, there's no couple of weeks here. There's no couple of weeks. Maybe you should do a budget extender till say, June. You, you've said that you don't know what the state's finances are. Look, should the Congress not show up? Should the military not show up? Should the police officers not show up? You're asking nurses to show up and do their duty. You're asking nurses at these drive-through testing facilities, like in New Rochelle, show up and do your duty which is to help the public health and put on a hazmat suit uh, and take blood. If we can ask nurses to put on a hazmat suit and take blood, we can ask uh, elected officials to come sit at a desk and vote on a piece of legislation. But Governor, there's a difference between healthcare professionals and lawmakers. I mean, up until last week, we were all here, we covered the legislature. There was no social distancing implemented whatsoever. So how is this week going to be? They should different? take all the precautions. But Bernadette, I need them to authorize the laws and the measures that we may need to do this. You need soldiers to fight the war. Government must function because government is doing all of this. Government goes home. Uh, none of this happens. I feel uh, New York City should be shut down. There's growing calls to have bars, restaurants, gyms, etc., closed mandatorily. How do you feel about that? Well, when you say New York City shut down, are you talking schools, businesses, or streets? I'm talking uh, entertainment, social gathering spots, bars, restaurants. All right, so because there are gradations, Jesse. Sure. The we started closing down, if you will, businesses with our 500 gatherings and 50% of occupancy. That is closing down businesses, gathering places, et cetera. So we have started that. Yeah, there were reports everywhere last night that bars were full, restaurants were full, people weren't abiding by the, by the reduction. Well, the then they're violating the law if they're doing that, and then the NYPD should come in and shut them down. Right now, if your question is, should we get more aggressive in the shutdowns? That's something we're looking at. And you look at those numbers every day and there's a knob and you turn the knob. 
uh, higher or lower, depending on what you see. If, and I've heard what you've heard, uh, if people are not enforcing the law, or if the numbers are continuing at a rate, then yes, I will get more aggressive on the mandatory regulations. I'm asking them today, voluntarily close down. Voluntarily close down your bar, your restaurant, your gymnasium. Let's see what they do. Uh, if nobody does it, uh, then we can take more actions. By the way, at one, one point, uh, people actually react uh, reasonably and responsibly. Uh, and uh, people say, you know what, I'm not going to go into a bar with 100 other people bumping up against me because it's too high a risk to uh, have a martini. I can have a martini at home. Uh, clarify what you might want them to do as far as a state budget if they come back this week. Would you want them to do it this week? And to what extent would that spending plan be? Bare bones, medium bones? The full I want them to budget? do. I want them to do their job. Do you want it done this week? I want them to. No, I want them to do their job. I want the U.S. Congress to sit in there and do their job. I want. I hear you. I want the judges to sit in there and do their job. Uh, I want my team to do what I'm doing, which is sit in here and do my job. Con this is why you are in government. This is why you're here. If you didn't want to be here, you shouldn't have run for office. You shouldn't have elect been, uh, you shouldn't have sought out a public service job. If you didn't want to fight the war, you shouldn't have enlisted in the military, okay? If you didn't want to do a public service at a time when you have a social crisis, then you shouldn't be here. You made a mistake in career. If you didn't want to help sick, peop sick people, you shouldn't be a nurse, right? Uh, if you wanted to stay away from alcohol, you shouldn't have been a bartender. This, you know, that's the essence of what we do. This is the essence of what we do. There is no higher, more necessary, purer form of public service then what we're doing right now, this is it. Do your job. Are you offering any guidance to legislators about closing their offices or bringing staff up? Legislators are people. I'm offering them the same guidance I'm offering everyone. Social distancing, be smart. Your elected officials, be smart. Like a business owner, like my kids, like my neighbors, like everyone. Should, should, should the state workers, the emergency, should nurses be putting their health at risk? Should doctors be putting their health, health at risk? Should OGS employees be putting their health at risk? It's not like they're working in a hospital or taking blood. They're working in a state capital reading paper and passing bills. Right. Just a question for a second. You're talking about bringing, let's say, 100 Democrats into a small conference room from all over the state. So going in a bigger room. And then dispersing back to their communities. Doesn't that seem to be like the very definition of how you spread then a disease? Then be in a bigger room. Look, you're bringing the U.S. on that theory, Jesse. No U.S. Congress, no U.S. Senate, no military operation. I mean, you shut down everything. No New York Times. <laughs> Please, uh, just go back. Do you, do you want the budget done this week? Is that what you're... No. No, it's April 1 is the deadline. Can you, can you issue an executive order to maybe make them or have the legislature vote remotely? Is that possible? Have you thought about that? I have not thought about that. Is that a possibility? I don't know if it's legally a possibility. Why are we so worried? I know the self-interest here because they're in this building. I get it. But everybody is going through this everywhere. They're not doing a high-risk occupation, right? 
Uh, well, politics today could be considered a high-risk occupation. But uh, yes, they could come here, do administrative work. We're having people, the reason I'm, I have difficulty with this concept, I mean, I'm having people go into hospital emergency rooms. I have people going to people's homes to take blood from people who believe they're positive. Uh, compared to what we're asking people to do in public service, I mean, this is not even in the same category. You implemented social distancing rules like the 500, you know, half capacity, et cetera. But again, you have thousands of people that come into the state capitol every day. We're closing it to visitors. Right. People have been coming in for the past two weeks. Yeah, but people are coming into every building. Yeah. You have two corporate executives in every office building who are sick. You've had hundreds of people who have been walking into the New York Post for four weeks. You have people in the New York Post who are positive. I mean, you, otherwise you just shut down everything. And take a deep breath. People are going to get sick. Many, many, many people will get the virus. 40% of the population, 50% of the population, 60% of the population, 80% will self-resolve. We're talking about that vulnerable population Senior citizens, immune compromised, underlying illness, like the people who have passed away so far, like people who pass away from the flu, the operational problem is they're going to overwhelm the ICUs. That's all we're talking about. You have to take a deep breath. We're not talking about the Ebola virus here. Uh, and you're reflecting, frankly, the same level of anxiety that people, by and large, are reflecting. No, don't panic. Don't shut down everything. And don't shut down the operation that is responsible for handling the situation. Let me say this one more time. It just seems like you're giving us contradictory information here. Uh, you can't have more than 500 people together. You want businesses to close. In, to in a dense location. There will, there, there will be 500 people. Well, then, what, no, not in a building. In the small complex and the assembly No, it's 50% of occupancy rate of this building. The occupancy rate of this building would be in the thousands. I'm a little confused with what you are you going to limit occupancy of people who work here? No. You said it's inconsistent with the regulation I passed. My regulation was 50% of rated occupancy for a room. Right? The Congress is up. You want to close down the Congress? By your reasoning, you'd have to close the Congress, you'd have to close the Senate, you'd have to close the White House, you'd have to close all the federal agencies. Well, what's not essential that we're talking about today? to um, your minor April 1st, and I'm hearing that lawmakers are being told to focus on being prepared to pass the budget for weeks ahead. You want to pass it early? I say great. Is this a state budget, do you think, or are you throwing out the big ticket issues like a circus seat, big thing, things like that, and just keeping the lights on, or are you still working towards deals on those? As I said before, it doesn't go skinny fat. Uh, I would not rush an issue that we're not ready to do, right? Uh, I don't want to pass or sign a bad piece of legislation that is not thought through. So if there's a complex issue that is not thought through, fine. But the 99% the of these issues are fully thought through, everybody understands them, it's yay or nay, they just don't want to say yay or nay 
because they're controversial and they're difficult and they're 50 50 issues or 60 40 issues so they don't want to take a side because then they're going to take the political heat from the other side but on those issues say yay or nay last question do you think they should still stick around after the budget is passed through the scheduled session or after the budget is passed i think they should do their job yeah I think they should do their job. On the issue of the federal intervention, what would this look like? And, and, and what, what is the goal with like the Corps and the Army coming in? So would they be taking state buildings and converting those into hospitals? What, what do you imagine that looking like? This is what they, this, I worked with the Army Corps of Engineers when I was in, at HUD. And we actually used them to build housing on Indian reservations, uh, Native American reservations. I have SUNY dorms. Uh, come in, take my SUNY dorm, retrofit it for a medical facility, and then I'll contact medical schools and nursing schools, and I'll find extra excess people to come staff that SUNY dorm. Uh, what federal facilities do they have available that we could now convert? So we have properties and buildings right? I have colleges. I would do any of these buildings. I just don't have the physical construction capacity uh, to organize that. You know, government doesn't build. My government doesn't build, right? We contract out everything. And for us to contract out, you need a design, you need a plan, you need an RFP, uh, and then you have to be able to pay for it. The only government that builds is the federal government like uh, to, this to create? You, well, I'll ask Dr. Zucker, what do you think the capacity differential could be between the number of ICU beds we have, 3,000, by the which, by the way, 80% of occupied of the current ICU beds. So even if you had beds to get some of the people out of the ICU beds, right? Uh, because if 80% are occupied of 3,000, that means we only have 600 beds. We just said, how many are in ICU beds so far? Yeah, but how many did we say are in ICU beds? We have 65. 65. So we have 65 today, and we only have uh, 600. Yeah. Well, I think this goes to the modeling that we're working on to try to figure out the spread of disease, the period of time, as the governor mentioned about the issues of flattening that curve. That will help us determine how many you need because you don't want to have all of them at one time. If you flatten that curve, you can spread that over a period of time. And we have, we have a, a team trying to model that out, and then I can answer your question more directly. I would say this, non-scientific based answer which I would not rely on because I rely on the good doctor in science. My number, you need thousands. You're going to be thousands short. Oh, I see you guys. Thousands. 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 Governor, have you spoken with federal officials? Have now, have had any success in trying to purchase more? You cannot purchase more ventilators. We have several thousand. The ICU beds have the ventilators. We have 3,000 ventilators. You could use thousands. You will need thousands of more ventilators. Could you? Yeah. Governor, could you please expand on what you mean by non-essential services for the court system? What do you think that wraps into? Arraignments have to happen. Child protective services have to happen. Uh, family court emergency orders has to happen. Uh, Non-essential motion practice, motions that you could hear later on. Uh, civil matters that you could hear later on. I'll leave that to the chief judge. But anything that is public safety is essential. Uh, anything that is criminal justice is essential. But uh, any matter that is not time sensitive, uh, that is about uh, money recoveries as opposed to a more imminent need, uh, let the chief judge make those decisions.
federal officials about the potential for domestic travel restrictions in and out of nope. New York? Okay. What's the numbers? I can't, couldn't see on the board for New York City. What are the new totals now? Not that one. New York City. 329. 29. And also, what more can you tell us about the new death? Where was this individual? What county and what hospital she treated mm -hmm. at? Sure. So there was one individual who was an elderly, uh, elderly person that was identified um, yesterday who had multiple medical conditions uh, and we're getting more information about that, that that person was in a New York City hospital. Do you know which hospital? We usually don't like to give out the hospital names. Yesterday, Mayor de Blasio said Wyckoff Medical. So there, there, well, there are three there are three deaths that the governor mentioned two yesterday and then the one today. Uh, one of those was um, also well, the others are also with medical many other medical conditions as well. Okay, so three deaths total or four? There are three deaths total. Yes. And Two seven, yesterday and one today. The 79-year-old woman today was in New York City. Is that right? Died in New York City. Died in New York City. When was she first admitted, or when when did she die? Yesterday? She died. She died today, and she was admitted um, within the past week. I can get you the exact date if you want. I know there was some discrepancy with Rockland County and getting that information over to the state. Is it difficult for county health examiners to um, report and identify? deaths related to the virus, and then also transferring that information to the state? Is that sort of a slow? No, no they're not so. I, the reason that was different was it, was it wasn't identified until the autopsy, which is a different scenario. And that was the delay. It was identified in an autopsy. And again, these numbers, they're coming in now at such frequency, depending when uh, you have the person sit down to make the chart, by the time you finish writing the chart, the chart is no longer accurate, right? So that's why you get a little bit of a variance. Last point I just want to stress, the, you need 1,000, in my opinion, not science-based, you will not be able to flatten the curve to avoid the wave. You will be short thousands of ICU beds thousands of ventilators. The only way to prevent that today, given this time constraint, is to deploy the Army Corps of Engineers and use that capacity to retrofit existing facilities to free up hospital beds. A decision is easy when you have no options. And here, this nation has no option. I sent the president a letter. That is a very rare occasion for me. Uh, I said to the president in the letter, I offer these suggestions as a governor, as a former cabinet secretary member, as a person who knows how the state government works and how the federal government works. This is the state that has the highest number of cases. I said to the president, in all sincerity, there's no place for politics. I'm not playing politics. I don't give a darn, Democrat, Republican, uh, whatever you are. This is about Americans protecting Americans' lives. And I will work in full partnership with the president on this issue 100%. But I ask him personally to take this seriously. I know it's a dramatic action. It may be an unprecedented action. This is a dramatic time and an unprecedented time. And great challenges require great leaders and great solutions. And that's what this is. Thank you very much.